What is good, my people? We are live back again with another episode of The Forecast. Now, we as a people cannot afford to be distracted. We've been dealing with the same old thing for decades, and we're still having conversations that we had 50 years ago. Now, we all can agree that white supremacy needs to be destroyed. But what we don't understand and what we are not taught is how much fighting back we have actually done. Back in 1966 in California, a riot known as Hunters Point Social Uprising started after a white cop, Alvin Johnson, shot an unarmed 16-year-old brother, Matthew Johnson, in the back. Now the cop ended up shooting his brother four times in his back. And when the word started to get out about the shooting, some people started to plan to storm the police station. The San Francisco police commander at the time tried to tell the people that they were going to do an investigation, trying to calm them down. But back in 1966, they were already tired of that story. And of course, the people weren't satisfied with that answer. So then a few hours later, some people started throwing rocks at the police, raiding white-owned businesses, and smashing white people cameras. By 7.35 that night, it was officially declared a riot. So trying to calm the crowd down, the mayor announced the cop had been suspended. But you already know they didn't say anything about charges. But when the mayor was making an announcement, somebody threw a rock and almost hit him in the head. Then by 11 o'clock that night, reports of window smashing and looting started coming in. And by 11.45, the governor officially declared it a state of emergency. He asked for 2,000 guards to be sent in and imposed a curfew from midnight to 6 a.m. And it was the biggest police mobilization in San Francisco since World War II. And that night, things were relatively calm. But then the next morning, black residents started gathering at the Bayview Community Center. And they weren't doing anything but protesting the police shooting. But then the San Francisco police got local volunteers who called themselves the police patrol. And they were deputized and given guns by the police. And they went to confront the crowd of about 700 people. So in retaliation, some of the people started throwing rocks, bricks, and bottles at the police. Some people even threw Molotov cocktails. So then the police started shooting at the crowd, shooting at the community center where black women and about 200 black children were for their safety. And at least seven people were reported injured. Now, some of the people did have guns and shot back at the police. But some people tried to run into the opera house and then the police shot out the opera house. The violence lasted until about nine o'clock that night. And another curfew was imposed from eight o'clock that night until six o'clock the next morning. By the end, the riot lasted 128 hours or almost six days, and 359 people were arrested. 51 people ended up getting injured, including six cops and two firefighters. Then after all of that, the cop, Alvin Johnson, was able to return to his job and go right back to patrolling, and ended up retiring in 1971. Now this police shooting of his brother, Matthew Johnson, was one of the last straws that led Huey Newton and Bobby Seale to create the Black Panthers. And I know the Black Panthers were systematically destroyed But if we don't find a way to address these issues, then we're going to be having the same conversation another 50 years from now. In Wisconsin, an unarmed brother, Manuel Burnley Jr., was shot in the back by Brown Deer police. Now let's see how this brother ended up getting shot in his back by the police. 
Testimony underway in the trial of a Brown Deer police officer, Devin Kramer. She's accused of shooting an unruly but unarmed suspect in the back almost two years ago. Pete Trevac is live at the courthouse with today's developments. Pete. Carol and Steve, the jury spent much of today reviewing surveillance video from the day of the shooting. We want to warn you that some of that can be tough to watch. This squad car video captured the aftermath of the shooting. It happened almost two years ago near 60th and Brown Deer. Jurors also watched this surveillance video from an MCTS bus. Officers Devin Kramer and Michael Lehman pull Manuel Burnley Jr. from the bus because he's arguing with the driver. The prosecutor says Burnley Jr. did not plan to hurt anyone. Yes, you may hear Manuel Burnley is foul out. But what you'll also hear, the evidence will show, not one time did he punch an officer. Not one time did he kick an officer. Once off the bus, video shows Burnley Jr. resisting handcuffs and all three people fall to the ground. He's moving his arms, he's thrashing around. He doesn't want to be handcuffed. It's not as if he's just sitting there. Kramer's lawyer says she believed she and her partner were in danger. She thought Burnley Jr. could be armed and fired a single shot into his back. But an expert for the state does not believe her because she holstered her gun right after firing. You'll hear his voice, but you won't see his face. The judge has ordered us not to show any witnesses. It makes no sense to shoot him once and have him still be moving and yelling and so forth and put your gun away. If this is a deadly threat, why would you put your gun away? That's not how officers are trained. Now, Kramer remains on administrative suspension from Brown Deer PD. We can tell you that the state will continue to call witnesses tomorrow morning when court wrapped up for the day. They had just sworn in their second witness, which was Officer Lehman. Yeah. An argument over a bus transfer leads to an officer involved shooting in just minutes. The Brown Deer officer, 28-year-old Devin Kramer, is facing a felony aggravated battery charge in the March 2016 shooting. This is how it's going to work. You can get a $691 DCK for coming and swearing like this in public in front of the other passengers, or you can get off. The day's been dominated by the bus's onboard video showing the victim, Manuel Burnley, arguing with the driver, who then flagged down police. When he refused to leave the bus, Burnley was dragged off by the officers and taken to the ground. Within seconds, though it's hard to see, the gunshot can be heard as a dull thud as he's shot in the back. <laughs> Burnley wasn't armed, but according to the complaint, Kramer said she shot him because she was afraid he could have a weapon or could be going for her partner's gun. On the stand today, that partner said he didn't remember exactly what was said. He's going for my gun. Did you say that that day to Officer Kramer? I don't recall exactly what I said. Did you say it, Officer Lehman? Like I said, I don't recall exactly what I said. I was yelling for help. Now, we aren't able to show you the faces of the witnesses who testified here today, including the police officers involved, because the judge has issued a shield order of protecting them. He said he doesn't want them to feel nervous or intimidated by the cameras. And Nick, the man shot survived. Right, Patrick, he was hospitalized for 12 days, but he survived. He wasn't charged with a crime. He's expected to testify here tomorrow when court resumes. So Manuel Burnley Jr. ended up getting into an argument with a bus driver about a transfer. So the bus driver ended up flagging down some cops to get him put off the bus. Now this brother never threatened anybody. He was just mad about his bus pass or a transfer or whatever it was. So when these cops, Devin Kramer and Michael Lehman got there, he still refused to get off the bus until he got a refund. So then these cops just pulled him off the bus, but he was still arguing. Now he never threw a punch never kicked anybody, he never even threatened anybody. But these cops were determined to get him on the ground and put him in handcuffs. Now, it was the cop Michael Lehman that made all three of them fall. But the cop Devin Kramer said she thought it was Manuel Burnley that knocked him down. Now, she said while they were on the ground, he refused to put his hands behind his back. And she said at one point, he had his hands under his stomach like he was reaching for something in his waistband. But then she also said she thought he could have been reaching for her partner's gun. This white girl said she didn't know if he had a weapon, but he could have had a gun. And she feared for her life, so she had no other choice but to shoot this brother point-blank range in his back. And then all of a sudden, the other cop, Michael Lehman, 
has amnesia and doesn't remember anything he said. He can't remember if he said he got a gun, he's reaching for my gun, any of that. And this white girl said she thought he could have possibly had a gun, but she never searched him for a gun. And then she holstered her gun after just one shot. But you know if a black man did have a gun, they would still have guns pointed at you while you bleeding out on the ground. And if she was so scared, why did she put her gun away? Now they did end up charging this cop Devin Kramer with aggravated assault, making her the first cop in the Milwaukee area charged with shooting a black man. The state continues to call witnesses in the trial of Brown Deer police officer Devin Kramer. She's accused of unlawfully shooting Manuel Burnley Jr. almost two years ago. Pete Zervakis is live with the latest testimony. Pete. Carol Burnley Jr. survived but lost part of a lung. Now that shooting all began with an altercation on a bus and today in court, the other officer who along with Kramer responded to that bus took the witness stand. This video captured by a squad car shows Officer Michael Lehman performing chest compressions on Manuel Burnley Jr. right after Officer Devin Kramer shot him once in the back. According to Kramer's lawyer, she shot him because she feared for her safety and thought Burnley Jr. could be armed. While Lehman was on the witness stand, the prosecutor asked him if Burnley Jr. ever grabbed at his gun. I can't say yes or no. I believe someone was trying. How? Oh. Just what was happening around me. An order from the judge bans us from showing any witnesses. That's why you're only hearing Lehman's voice. He's describing this struggle. It happened after Lehman and Kramer escorted Burnley Jr. off an MCTS bus near 60th and Brown Deer almost two years ago. The driver said he was being argumentative. Lehman told Kramer's lawyer that Burnley was resisting handcuffs. Can you honestly tell this jury that you ever had control of Mr. Burnley until you heard the pop? No, I did not. Video from the bus shows Lehman, Kramer, and Burnley Jr. all falling to the ground right before the shot was fired. When you're wrestling around with Mr. Burnley, do you ever think he's got a weapon? I have that in the back of my head that he could possibly have a weapon. And if, he, if that's in the back of your head, then why would he be going for your weapon? You'd have to ask him that, sir. The defense rested today after Devin Kramer took hours of questions from an obviously skeptical prosecutor. Kramer said Manuel Burnley Jr. was irate and arguing with a bus driver when she and Officer Michael Lehman escorted him off of a bus near 60th and Brown Deer. Video shows all three people fell to the ground in a scuffle. Kramer testified that at that time, she did not realize Lehman had tripped Burnley Jr. and caused the trio to fall. When you go to the ground, you're thinking, holy cow, this guy took me down. I need to react, right? 100%. She said at some point during the struggle, Burnley Jr. put one arm underneath his body towards his waistband. Kramer testified she worried he had a weapon and shot him once in the back. In the totality of the circumstances and everything that I was faced with at that time, I didn't understand why an individual would be pinning his arm underneath him in the direction of his waistband. But the prosecutor asked her why Burnley Jr. was not searched after the shooting if she really thought he was armed. At what point did you alert a fellow Brown Deer officer that that guy might have a gun? I didn't. Kramer recounted the struggle that unfolded seconds after she and Officer Michael Lehman escorted Manuel Burnley Jr. off a bus near 60th and Brown Deer Road. He'd been arguing with the driver about a transfer policy. Kramer described trying to get one of Burnley Jr.'s arms under control after all three people fell to the ground. Trying to get it behind his back, I'm trying to control it, he's pulling away, he's throwing it around like this. She testified Burnley Jr. pulled that arm underneath his body. Kramer thought he might be armed and fired a single 45 caliber round into his back. I was in complete shock. I was emotional. This was a traumatizing experience for me. Like I said, no police officer wants to use this kind of force um, while at work. She described the scrum as the fight of her life. But the prosecutor said Burnley Jr. never threw any punches or kicked anyone. Kept his, trying to keep his arms away from you. That's all he's done, right? But with uh, extreme amount of strength and vigor, uh, violent, uncontrolled movements, yes. So much strength, so much violence, so angry, that not one time did he swing at you. 
No, he didn't, but he was still uncontrolled. Now, Kramer testified she did not tell other officers on the scene to search Burnley Jr. because she said following the shooting, the priority became first aid and saving his life. Now, with both sides in this case done calling witnesses, the jury will be back here at the courthouse bright and early Monday morning to hear closing arguments. Now, Manuel Burnley Jr. did survive, but he lost a part of his lung. And his white woman did go to trial, but of course she argued she feared for her life. She didn't try to pull out her baton. She didn't use her taser. She went straight for her gun and shot him and then put her gun up as soon as she shot him. She went with the same old story. I was scared of the big bad black man and I thought a taser wouldn't work. And the judge kept all of the witnesses faces from being shown, which is unusual. Too bad the judge didn't do it for that brother Joshua Brown. But during the trial, her partner didn't even know if the man was reaching for his gun or not. And if he already thought maybe he could have a gun in the back of his mind, why would he also think he was reaching for his? And even though they're supposed to be so scared of him, they didn't even tell other cops he might have a gun. And they didn't even bother to search him. Then during the trial, this white woman admitted she was emotional, calling this man violent, aggressive, saying she was in the fight of her life, even though this man didn't throw one punch. And then after a two-week trial, of course this white woman gets to walk free after a hung jury. A moment of embrace after Brown Deer officer Devin Kramer learned she will not be facing a retrial. Uh, the court will dismiss the case without prejudice, and that will be that. Monday morning, a judge officially dismissed her case. Kramer was on trial for shooting unarmed Manuel Burnley in the back in 2016, nearly killing him. It all started when Burnley was taken off of a Milwaukee County bus after arguing with the driver over bus fare. The case went to trial in February, but jurors could not come to a unanimous verdict on aggravated battery charges. We tried the case. Obviously, we weren't successful and we're not going to retry it. We don't believe we can meet our burden of proof at this point. Last week, the Black Panthers demanded the Brown Deer Police Chief fire Kramer. And the original Black Panthers of Milwaukee are demanding determination and or resignation of Officer Devin Kramer due to the actions that she committed in shooting Manuel Burnley Jr. in his back while he was laying on his stomach. She's been on administrative leave for more than two years since the shooting. The chief says an internal investigation will determine whether she can return to work. In Milwaukee, Eden Jekyll, WISN 12 News. Kramer and the district attorney both declined to comment. While the state has dismissed the case, the U.S. Attorney's District Office confirmed they will look into possible federal criminal charges. No new trial for the Brown Deer officer accused of unlawfully shooting a man more than two years ago. Officer Devin Kramer's two-week trial ended with a hung jury earlier this year. Pete Zervakis live at the Milwaukee County Courthouse with why the DA will not retry this case. Pete. Well, Carol, the DA made that decision after reviewing all of the testimony from Kramer's February trial. We have an obligation, an ethical obligation, to only bring cases forward that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Chief Deputy DA Kent Lovern says that's why police officer Devin Kramer won't be retried. She shot Manuel Burnley Jr. in 2016 after she and another officer pulled him off a bus near 60th and Brown Deer Road. Video from the bus showed a scuffle seconds before the shooting. Lovern says prosecutors put maximum effort into the case. We put a lot of resources, obviously, into it because it was an important matter that took place in our community. Burnley Jr. maintained he was not trying to harm the officers. Albeit that he did things that he wished he had maybe done differently, it didn't justify him getting shot in the back. His attorney says they're frustrated with today's decision. The DA's office uh, believes that um, you know, Officer Kramer did commit a crime that they're not going to retry, and I think uh, that's a disappointment, and I think it sends a, a concerning message. Lawyer Jonathan Safran says the U.S. attorney will now review the case for possible federal criminal charges. Now, Kramer, Kramer remains on administrative suspension from Brown Deer Police. The police chief says that is not going to change until the DA here in Milwaukee County officially dismisses the case and the department conducts its own internal review. So the court ended up dismissing the case with a lot of prejudice. And they said they won't be having a retrial despite the Black Panthers' demand for her to be fired. Now, this white woman, Devin Kramer, has been on paid vacation for two years. And now she can come back to the force if she wants, but she decided to resign. 
This white girl said the stress of the shooting in the trial has left her unable to work as a cop. Then she applied for duty disability, which was meant for cops and firefighters injured on the job. And then to reward her for shooting an unarmed black man, they ended up giving her $57,000 a year tax-free or $4,800 a month for life. More money than she was making while she was working. And the money comes from a state pension fund that's paid for by taxpayers. And the police in Milwaukee have already been exposed for a pattern of fraud because cops keep claiming they can't work due to stress. But at the end of the day, this white girl shot an unarmed black man in the back and was rewarded by being paid more than she makes working as a cop for life. Michael Burnley Jr. was shot and lost a piece of his lung and he still wasn't paid yet. But this white woman is set for life and can retire if she wants. But we can continue to expect the same results if we don't put aside whatever petty differences we have and get on code to do what we have to do. Because at the end of the day, we are all we got. And until we start taking justice, people will continue to shed our blood over and over and over. So they, they stop their car in the middle of the street and they run off in three different directions. The cop understands that something's up, right? So he runs, he picks Matthew to run after. Chased him all the way down third, down Palouse Street, down towards the shipyard. And he got down there, because down there was a fence to enter the shipyard. When we was chased by police, back in those days, and we, they chased us up on the hill. We lost them because they didn't know the hill like we did. The chase took a tragic turn when the officer pulled his gun. He said he called out for Matthew Johnson to stop, but then lowered his gun and shot the 16-year-old boy in the back. Well, we felt as though that was unjust. Shouldn't have killed him. That wasn't no grounds to kill him. Their life wasn't be, you know, wasn't threatened. So we start rioting, tearing up the whole community. And I was 16 years old. I'll never forget that day. People demanded that the mayor come to the area. The mayor did not come. And then, then at that point, things started getting out of hand. It scared the hell out of them. And uh, of course, the mayor. Uh, call the National Guard in here. The arrival of 1,200 armed National Guardsmen changed the tone. It was no longer a protest of police brutality. It was a race riot. National Guard came in and they camped out in, at uh, Candlestick Park. And then all of a sudden, one day, we were down hanging out and they come marching down 3rd Street and to 3rd and Newcomb and they started shooting at us. So we running all over the place, running from the bullets and everything. Well, we shoot back too, because we had our little zip guns. And we would run inside the opera house, and they would shoot up the opera house. Shoot, they shot up the man's car that is across the street from the opera house, that end house. I'll never forget, he had holes all in his car. Over six days, 359 people were arrested and 51 injured. Damn, police, look. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, look what the fuck they just did to this boy. Oh, look what the fuck they just did to this fucking boy, bro. Slammed his head on the fucking floor. And he picking his phone up. Make him put the man's phone down. For nothing. Let me go around traffic, for real. He just slammed this boy on the fucking floor. Oh my he hit his fucking head on the concrete, bro. Get in your car! Get in your car! 
in your car. Get in your car. Get in the vehicle. Get in the vehicle. Get in the vehicle. I need another unit here right now. Get in the vehicle. Shut the door. Shut the door. Shut the door. Get in the vehicle. Got him out of gunpoint. Get over here. Get in the vehicle and shut the door! He's back in the vehicle. I think we're going to release him. He's just approached my dad out and he's immediately started walking on my squad. That's his car. I have no idea who else is in there. You want to go to the approach? His keys are up on the thing. It's up to you. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You want to wait for the Kevin, show me your hands out the window. His window's shut. Go ahead and step right through. Do you have any passengers? Get back towards the sound of my voice. Lift up the bottom of your shirt. Go ahead, turn around. 360. Keep walking back towards the sound of my voice. Keep walking. 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 All right, get down on your knees. Get down on your knees. Cross your feet. Cross your feet. Lay down on your stomach. I don't know why I'm here. Man, this is long for precaution. I have no idea why you're approaching my vehicle like that. You can not get out on the traffic stop and walk on me. Here. <laughs> He cannot do that. That's why I'm asking for help. <laughs> he just came up immediately, started walking. I was just doing a precautionary thing, and he just walked up and would not turn around and get back in the vehicle. I literally almost, I have no idea. He almost struck me on my last traffic stop. He was all the lane. I was standing right here. His tires were over there, and I had to kind of jump close to her car. And that's the only reason. That's all I can think of. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I just such a close proximity. And he starts charging, coming at my car. She's calling 911. Cut the nigger card out? You are a racist. You are, no, come on over. Come on over. I can't, I'm getting attacked. I can't even talk right now. Oh, wow. By these two black women calling me a racist. Wow. Nigger! I never liked you. I never will like you, nigger. She getting the next stop, right, bus driver? Uh, yeah, yeah Jesus next name. stop. She out of here. Stop. In Jesus' name, you don't leave Jesus. Jesus' name. In Jesus. Oh, if I can Jesus. Fuck you, nigger. Jesus. Nigger, put your, your head down. Jesus. Jesus. Put your head down. Jesus. Nigger, put your head down, nigger. Jesus. Nigger, you got murdered. Your eyes are red. Nigger, that's why I said you're a nigger. 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 Nigger, that's why I said Hey, it's a nigga touching you. Bye. He lives in this building. So what are you doing he in my lives. building? It's you don't live here. here. He lives right you, upstairs. You don't live here. So I've never seen you before. So I've lived here 27 years. years. That's great. I've lived here why are you, years. Why are you doing this? Oh, why are you doing this? No, you're smooth. Why are you doing this? You're we the live here. King. You're sure. the smooth king. Sure. Just don't don't worry about it. We live here. Oh, now you we live here. here. So, lives here. what apartment do you live in? Don't worry. About let's it. let's let, no. Let's talk about neighbors. It's none of your business. 
It is my business. Why is it your business? Do you own this building? I've lived here 27 do you years. Own, do you own this building? As soon as you walked in, you said, who the F are these guys? I heard, he heard you. He heard you say it. He heard you say it. He lives here. He lives here. He lives here. If you live here, why can't you be a neighbor? He lives here. As a neighbor, I'm not going to well, you. I just, I'm asking. I've never seen you before. You walk through that door and say, who the f*** are these guys? Right, right. Exactly. My man lives here. I do, lives here. I do it to white people, too. No, you don't. We heard you at the door. We heard you say it. We heard you say, who the F are these guys? We heard you. And I opened the door for you to be nice. Enough to so open the door for you, you and you still do that. No, it is my business. Do you own this building? Yes, you're damn right I do. You, don't own this you see? You see? Yeah. You see what happens? Yeah. So what apartment are you? Where's your MAGA hat at, man? So don't worry about it. Where's your MAGA hat don't at, worry man? About it. I can, I can be as cool as you, dude. Where's the I Mac can, hat? I can be Yo, just like you. Why you bothering I us for? I can be just like you, bro. No, this guy, let's go. I can be just like you. My car is MAGA hat, MAGA yeah. hat. I can be MAGA just hat. like you, You guys. left your MAGA hat upstairs, I man. I can play the music. You left your MAGA hat upstairs, man. You Feel left your me. MAGA hat. I am, I am. Feel What's your name? What's your name? Uh, 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 oh, you scared? Oh, you scared? Doesn't matter. Because he don't matter. You gonna be on? You gonna be viral? You gonna be viral? You gonna be viral now? You happy? Put it on YouTube. I could give a fuck about YouTube. It's Sunday night. Cooking and catching up with their oldest son through FaceTime was on this Cape Coral couple's agenda. All of a sudden, um, we heard the siren. Until the safety measure was turned against them. Someone was using it to peer into the Browns' private What's life. What's going on, my main man, Shaq? It's your boy, Chance on Nold. Welcome to the Nold cast. What's going the on? The hacker starts talking doing? directly to the husband and wife about their son. Wait, wait, so did your child come out black or like, kind of like light skin? I don't know. What? Nothing. Who never appears on this three minute recording. But Josephine Brown believes the person manipulating their camera was watching for longer than he made known. But they, they've been watching us. Because my that's the only way you know I had a son and the only way you know what he looks like. The hacker focuses only on making racial comments. Is your kid a baboon, like the monkey? Spewing from their security camera over and over again. Wait, does your child look like an Oreo? It's very hurtful because, I mean, my son is biracial and the comments he made was really hurtful. Fed up with the hateful invasion of privacy. Can you bring like a web browser up on your phone and then type in the website that I tell you? No. Why? I'll leave you and your family alone. Or I could do this. I like your dog. The camera batteries are ripped out. Hey, go to no. The Browns called Ring immediately. The company did not respond to my requests, but did tell the family, quote, the email address and password of one of your external accounts was exposed in a data breach. Ring believes someone used that information to gain access into their account. Josephine says she is constantly changing the Wi-Fi password and believes the company needs to step up. Fixing it, put more security stuff on there, do more updates on the cameras, making sure everything, you know, runs the way it's supposed to, but I don't, I don't know. I went to a tech expert. Michelle Bordoff says there's one trusted way to keep your system safe. Wired cannot be hacked. Somebody has to be in your home, hardwired to your modem to see anything on your network. Josephine's experience is leaving her in the dark about the products she trusted. I was scared. I was scared. I didn't know who that is, how long he'd been watching us. Yeah, I was, and I'm still scared now because I don't have an answer. The tech experts suggest opening up your Wi-Fi network. Check to see what your neighbors are named after. Go ahead and help them out. Also, they suggest changing the default password that most of our systems come with. The Democratic narrative leading up to 2020 has, is now being formulated. And it's being formulated in real time. It's being backfilled. And it's being backfilled because it turns out that the Democratic narrative was supposed to be Donald Trump is a Russian tool. And it's no longer Donald Trump is a Russian tool. Now it is America is rife with racism. Donald Trump is representative of the James Buchanan South. That Donald Trump is representative of, of John C. Calhoun. Right? That, that's, that, that is who Trump is. That's what America is. And this is now the narrative that is being pushed by the left. Now, as I say, as we will see, there is, a, there is more than a grain of truth to the idea that slavery was a deeply rooted endemic part of American life for several hundred years. Right, beginning in 1619 and ending officially in 1863.
right? Yes, that is official. It depends on whether you're dating it from the Emancipation Proclamation or the 14th Amendment, you might say 1865. In any case, the, the fact is, slavery was, of course, a massive part of America's history. Jim Crow was a massive part of America's history. But it is a lie to suggest that America was founded based on slavery. Surely the Puritans who arrived in, in, on the Mayflower were not there to bring slavery about, nor was it the Southern economy that lent the great strength of America's economy her strength. We'll get to that in just one second, but here's the thing. Beto O'Rourke, who is now trying to channel exactly what the media want from him. So Beto O'Rourke is a man in search of love. Beto O'Rourke had that love back in the 2018 Senate race against Ted Cruz. He had it going, right? It was, it was gonna be his moment and the media loved him for it. Well, now Beto O'Rourke is a man in search of love. He is searching for media love and the only way he can see toward finding it is becoming the most white woke person on planet Earth. So yesterday, Beto announces his campaign. His campaign is that America was founded on racism and so we need a woke white guy who was born into immense privilege. He's worth about $9 million because his daddy was very, very wealthy and very, very powerful in his area. We need that guy to lead us to a broader American future. In this country, though we would like to think otherwise, was founded on racism, has persisted through racism, and is racist today. But this racism, though foundational, for so long, it had flown under the surface. But it was only until this administration and this president that that racism was invited out into the open. Trump is the real America, according to Beto O'Rourke, right? Trump is representative of America's true, dark, evil, slave-ridden heart. Now, you may be saying to yourself, I've never held a slave. I am not a racist. And you're right. You've never held a slave. You're not a racist. But according to the Democrats, even if you are not a racist, you still suffer from the after pangs of white supremacy. It is buried deep within you. It is unconscious. It's exactly as AOC said a couple of weeks ago in a tweet thread. White supremacy is so deeply embedded in American life that there is no way of extricating it from American life, which suggests that the only solution is radical chemotherapy. But if the cancer is everywhere, if it has infected the entire body politic, the only answer is radical chemotherapy. And that's what Beto is calling for. This justifies the radical changes Democrats are calling for. It justifies the overthrow of a lot of the wonderful, great things about America. Because after all, if all those wonderful, great things are rooted in one of the most evil institutions in the history of mankind, it's difficult to make the moral case for them being retained, even if they have had some good positive effects. Let me know. You say you don't like me. I don't like you. I don't like you. Stop doing my fucking face. 